Good morning. I'm Janet Irwin, Head of Education at the Ulrich Museum. And thanks to everyone for joining us this morning for our ongoing series of 10 paired faculty talks taking place during the 23rd Faculty Biennial. It's all part of the process. On view through May 8th, our galleries are open with safety protocols in place Monday through Saturday, 11 to 5, and as always, free to all. Now, now in its 46th year, the biennial showcases the breadth of creative work and research being undertaken by the faculty of the School of Art, Design, and Creative Industries in art history, art education, ceramics, curatorial practice, drawing, graphic design, painting, photography, printmaking, sculpture, and new media. This series of talks on the biennial's theme, it's all part of the process, seeks to prompt reflections and start conversations about each faculty member's personal process, highlighting the, the diversity of activities that contribute to creative practice, from research to studio time, to interactions with colleagues and students. I hope you will join us for the next virtual, virtual faculty talks on Thursday, April 7th at 10 a.m. with Jennifer Ray, Associate Professor of Photo Media and Adjunct Instructor, Megan St. Clair. Our guest faculty this morning is Dr. Brittany Lockhart, Associate Professor of Art History and Creative Industries in the School of Art and Design and Creative Industries at WSU as of last May. Woo -woo. She is particularly proud of receiving a College of Fine Arts Mickey and Pete Armstrong Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2017. Dr. Lockhart's research interests include body diversity, identity politics, and food. This year, she presented a paper called Trumping Beauty Standards. Is it okay to fat shame people we don't like? At the College Art Association Conference. Spoiler alert, the answer is no. Her recent publications include the text for the Ulrich Sculpture Act, excuse me, Sculpture App, download today for free on iTunes. The Fat Body as Anatomical and Medical Oddity, Lucian Freud's Paintings of Sue Tilly, and Visualizing the Body in Art, Anatomy, and Medicine Since 1800, published by Rutledge, and Who Are You Calling Fat? Eating Disordered Thinking, and Jenny Seville's Plan and Prompt in FKW. Following the talk, we will invite all of you to join, to turn on your cameras and mics and join us virtually for the Q&A. You may also add your questions and comments to the chat box throughout the presentation. And good morning, Brittany. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jana, for that um, enthusiastic woot woot. And thanks everyone for coming to my talk. Um, so thinking about process, I had a lot of questions and ideas about how to frame this for you all. Um, because I think that just objectively, my process is less interesting than what the other faculty in our program do. So uh, for instance, I am not moving around one ton letterpress um, machines that might, you know, crush my extremities. And I'm not um, like Jeff Pulaski, that was a reference to him. <laughs> and I'm not making sculpture out of molten metal heated up like lava that could, you know, maim or kill me, uh, like Barry Badgett. And I'm not traveling to foreign countries to build big kilns and lighting things on fire, uh, like Ted Adler. And I am a thousand percent not going into scary locations in the dark uh, where I might <laughs> um, get, you know, arrested and detained in a foreign nation or serial murdered uh, like Jennifer Ray because I am a coward and I fear death. So I'm <laughs> pleased to tell you that the scariest place that I go is the library stacks. Um, eh, and I love the library, but you, you have to admit they're a little creepy. So while I was thinking about process, I decided what I was gonna do was invite you into my brain and I'm gonna sort of take you through how I've come to think about what it is that I do and why that I do it. And it's gonna be really circuitous. So I'm sorry, I have to live with it and today, so do you. 
So the first thing when I thought about in terms of process was this. In graduate school, uh, I started knitting and I've done it for years until I hit this particular project, <laughs> which I have been working on for three years. It is it is my nemesis, it is my arch rival, it is my Thanos. Uh, and in my defense, um, <laughs> I'm making this for our own beloved Alicia Fully Love, and she is super extra. So this is what it is supposed to be um, when it is finished, which will be glorious. So I, I hope it happens before we all die. Um, but <laughs> the reason why I started doing this, among other things, was that in graduate school, I used to have a social life and I would go and do things and talk to people, which is crazy. Uh, so I would go out with you know my friends from high school or college or my brothers and their friends, and we would all be talking and they all were in school for or doing things that made sense inherently and everyone understood why and what they were doing. So there were lawyers, so many lawyers, um, and there are people in medical school and there are people in dental school and people who are paralegals and people who are actuaries and businessy McBusiness people who did business things. And then we would get to me and they would ask what I was doing. And I was, you know, say I was, I'm studying art history and I would get two responses. One is, after I explained what art history was, of course. Um, one was, oh, you do art history, cool do you know the guy that does the thing with the stuff? And I would say, yes, I love that artist and his things of stuff. And the other was, why would you do that? What is the point of that? And how are you gonna get a job doing it? And so I didn't have answers to any of those questions because I was a student and I do now, but I didn't then. And so I liked knitting because no one ever asks you why you're knitting. They can see why you're doing it. You're making a hat or a giant blanket for your friend to wear as a scarf. Uh, it just makes sense. Which brings me to, I told you this would be circuitous, which brings me to the work of Marcel Duchamp. Uh, you've probably, all or most of you have probably seen his most famous sculpture, the fountain on the left here, which is a urinal that has been, um, removed from its context and turned on its side. But around this time, he was doing lots of other um, removals of ordinary objects like this bicycle wheel or trap, which makes me laugh a little bit every time I see it. It's a coat rack laid down as a, a fall hazard. And this sort of process culminated in this work called Mile of String because it's a mile of string. Some people say as much as 16. I think that's probably an overestimate but it's a mile of string that's been run through a, a gallery in an exhibition of surrealist art. And he also had children sort of bouncing balls through this room and playing hopscotch in the exhibition. And people were absolutely flummoxed by this and by why he was doing it. Uh, so I'll give you a little broader context. So I think that art is about work uh, and process, if you will, because as you can see the same year that he first made the bicycle wheel, Henry Ford made the first automated assembly line um, to increase productivity. But this wasn't a completely original idea out of nowhere. This comes from the industrial revolution, right? And he'd been looking at factories where people made flour and canneries and meat packing industries uh, and thinking about productivity. And there was a whole new field of science for this, of scientific management, um, with two basic approaches. Uh, one done by Saucy Frederick Winslow Taylor up there. Um, he just must have been the most fun ever at parties. So he worked in a steel factory and he would go around with a stopwatch and time everyone to see how long it took them to do their jobs. Uh, and then figure that if he could standardize everything, then it would go faster. Um, and the other, which is called motion studies because they filmed people with a camera um, was instituted by this married couple, Frank and Willie and Gilbreth, uh, who were trying to minimize the motion that people had to do rather than standardizing it. Um, so 
that's happening um, at this time. And I don't want to spend too long on it, but this is even being applied beyond sort of the realm of um, traditional work, right? And moving into domesticity. So um, our, our old friend Lillian Gilbreth from the motion study has even designed a kitchen to maximize efficiency of the worker uh, in the domestic realm. Uh, and just to show you how widespread this is, this was even happening in Germany, another woman um, whose name I'm, I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> was designing this Frankfurt kitchen uh, and this was put into over 10,000 homes but also designed um, based on sort of industrial models for increasing efficiency. Which brings me back to Duchamp whose entire output I think was about resisting and denying work of this kind of industrialized scientific um, model it is about taking things that should work and make things more efficient uh, and stopping them from doing that. So taking a coat rack, which should um, give you a really clear place to hang your coat so it's out of the way and then you always know where it is and you can always find your keys and it increases your efficiency in the home um, and putting it on the floor where you could fall and hurt yourself or taking a bicycle, which is a thing that we use to go farther faster with less effort and making it so that it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and then, you know, taking a, an art exhibition and making it so that not only can we not like efficiently move through the space and map our movements, we can't even enter it. And now it's not a place of work and efficiency, it's a place of play and childhood and wonder. And I think in some respects, that's kind of what I do in my work <laughs> is I, work against efficiency. Uh, and the first thing that came to mind was not so much my research, but my teaching, because um, I think I'm a bit notorious among the students for asking a lot of questions in class. And I don't ask them one at a time, I ask them in a series. I started <laughs> having to put them in my PowerPoints because I asked too many and people couldn't follow me. And these are just some that I took out of random PowerPoints that I had from when we used to get to be in the classroom and ask students questions. Uh, but more than that, I'm also um, infamous for answering questions with a question. So Brittany, why do you, why do you think that um, Jackson Pollock did this? Well, I don't know, student, why do you think Jackson Pollock did that? And the reason that I don't answer those questions is not because I don't have an answer, it's because I don't think it's useful for me to tell you what I think. Um, what I want is for you to think critically about what interested you. Why did you come up with that question? Why do you think he did it? How does it relate to the other things that we've seen? And critical thought is not efficient or productive. It is the opposite of that. What Henry Ford did not want from his assembly line workers was them asking questions like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Is this making humanity better? Is there a better way to do this? How do the Chinese make assembly lines? Like all of that is very inefficient and it doesn't help you do your job faster. Um, unfortunately for me and, and probably Duchamp, we lost we lost this race uh, because making workers more fast and productive is a science that is still very much alive today. You can get a degree and a master's degree in it here at WSU, it's called engineering management. And I am not in any way disrespecting this field because I live in the hope that one day they'll figure out a way for me to never have to answer an email again. Uh, what? And, you know, again, there are consultants and websites and all kinds of things you can do um, as a company to increase productivity. I'm super fascinated by the way that we've imported this kind of thinking into our personal lives. So you can download apps to increase your own personal productivity. And I picked this one called Rescue Time. This is their like dashboard from the app, um, you know, because like any anti-efficiency person, I have a lot of questions. What are we rec rescuing time from? fun, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but one of the things that happens, I think, 
when you're so interested in productivity and timing and motion is that we become very invested in the outward signs of productivity. We like people who are on the phone. We like people who are taking notes and walking with purpose. Um, so much so that we're even developing cheats to look like we're busy. So there's a, a wiki how to look busy and you can um, go to websites that will make it look like you're working on a graph or whatever. When your boss walks by, you can click over to that website. Um, and I find all of this fascinating because when I feel like I am most productive uh, and efficient, um, this is what it looks like. So, you know, but fatter. So I guess like this. Um, so I know that that does not look like work. And the reason I know that is because when I'm doing this, uh, I get a lot of this. Hey, and Britt, do you want to play sorry with us? Hey, and Britt, do you want to play cars with us? Hey, Brittany. Oh, it looks like you're not busy. Can we talk about this curriculum issue real quick? Or, Hey, Brittany. Um, do you have time to talk to me about my schedule for fall? Uh, so people see this and interpret it as doing nothing. Um, I'm sorry, by the way, Jeff Pulaski, if you feel personally attacked by that last comment. Um, so <laughs> so uh, a lot of the parts of my research process look like that, look like me not working. Um, so for instance, there's the, the sort of traditional research in the library stacks where I'm looking at books or articles. And I went back to grad school and pulled out this legitimate three ring binder where I printed out all these news articles and scholarly articles about Lucian Freud. Uh, and as you can see, highlighted them in different colors that meant things at that time, I don't remember, um, because I could not afford the internet. I was very poor. Um, so now this is all online. Uh, and people understand that you're working when you're doing that, when you're printing and three hole punching and highlighting. Um, but afterwards, you got to think about these articles, like what is important? What assumptions did the author make? Do I agree with this? Where's the evidence? Why this work and not that work? Um, and all of that, again, is more just of this. Uh, and then another really important part of my process is sustained close looking. So I have seen both of these works in person. The Lucian Freud was on loan in New York and the Shu Hong Fei sculpture is actually in Overland Park. By the way, if you happen to be doing a weekend trip to Kansas City, the Overland Park Arboretum, one is just a nice walk. It's super shady because it's an arboretum. Uh, but two, they have an international sculpture collection that is worth um, your time. But I go and I look at these things and I do it for a long time. And I think about the things while I'm looking at them. And I know that it's slow looking because the people that I went to see these things with left me. They just got bored and left while I was still <laughs> looking and thinking. Um, and it's a really important process too because I get to listen and observe other people observing the work and observing me observing the work. And people have a lot to say about a fat woman looking at another fat woman. Um, so that becomes part of my understanding of the way that people are interpreting these objects and interpreting um, my body. So just spoiler alert, if you see someone really deep in thought in front of a painting, be careful what you say or you might end up in their dissertation. Uh, and then I'm, and my latest work taking on a new kind of scholarship that involves a lot of me staring into space. Um, so this new approach is called autoethnography. And if you're humanities, you probably are not familiar with this or maybe have heard the word. It didn't come from us, it came from postmodern philosophy. And these philosophers were thinking like, what is knowledge? What is ob objectivity? What is neutral? Why do we have so many empirical or quantitative approaches to knowledge? And began to suggest that there, there really is no such thing as neutrality or objectivity. 
And you might be thinking, what well, that's the whole point of the scientific method is that anybody can perform the same experiment and get the same results. What could be more neutral? But the thing is the person who designed the experiment chose what they were testing for and they picked the variables and they decided the question to ask uh, and they interpret the results. So um, it's not neutral in that sense. Um, and what I really found exciting about autoethnography is there's lots of different kinds of knowledge and ways of thinking and seeing and learning um, and new kinds of voices are welcome because if you think about an objective neutral authority and, and picture it, I think you know what he looks like. Uh, so <laughs> it was also exciting to me because it, it makes you um, interrogate your own relationship to the thing that you're studying and acknowledge that you're bringing implicit bias and your own baggage with you um, that might not be everyone's baggage when they look at the thing. Uh, and this kind of knowledge is, is more commonly used in science, social science fields like anthropology or sociology. I'm gonna read you a couple of quotes that made me excited about it. Uh, and I'm gonna leave out the word sociology because I think it's more broadly applicable. Um, but autoethnography is a highly personalized or highly personalized accounts that draw upon the experience of the author researcher for the purposes of extending understanding. And I really like that idea of extending, expanding, opening knowledge. Um, personal narratives can address several key theoretical debates macro and micro linkages. So I could look at big structures like industry, medicine, government, the university, um, and then see how those impacted on a personal level, me and other people. Structure agency and their intersection. So I'm always interested in giving um, people agency within these bigger structures and social reproduction and social change, which are very important to me. And I felt like Autoethnography really resonated with a couple touchstones that I've been building my work around ever since I was that graduate student knitting in the corner at the party. No, I didn't take my knitting to a party. Um, one is Linda Nochlin that you, you see her on the left here. And she wrote many important essays, but in one she talked about reading these interpretations of French painting and the author assumed that everyone that was looking at the painting was a white Christian man and she was a Jewish woman and she felt shut out of the house of meaning. And it became very important to me to not do that, um, to open the doors and welcome everyone to come into the house of meaning. Uh, and then another touchstone was Audre Lorde, who you see on the right there who said the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so thinking about that and the things that I would like to change and make better in the world, um, I can't do that through rational, objective, quantitative knowledge because that's already been purposed to marginalize and exclude the people that I wanna invite into this house of meaning with me. Uh, and then lastly, um, Tracy Royce, who I don't have a picture of because she's still young and doesn't have a Wikipedia page yet. But she said, research is no panacea. And that really struck me, the idea that just, just doing research and writing about it doesn't fix anything. It's no cure for anything. Um, and then she went on, particularly if it is inaccessible, linguistically, theoretically, epistemologically, otherwise, to advocates, activists, and stakeholders in the community. Um, and that also really excited me about autoethnography because it's, it's instead of like starting here with Luce Irigaray or Foucault or whatever, I get to start here with my experience and then build a ramp that gives everyone access to this kind of knowledge. Uh, so <laughs> the process of doing autoethnography also involves a lot of things that don't look like work um, for me, it involves going back through my journals, which I kept for most of my life. I should start doing that again, right? Uh, from childhood and to well into graduate school. And I think you can guess for yourself which one of these I bought on my own and which ones were gifts from my mom. Um, <laughs> but, so it's, uh, it's a slow process, partially because some of the things that are in there are really painful, right? They're, you write things that are traumatic and painful for you. 
Um, and partially because it's hard to take something that is a really personal struggle and think about it in a broader, more social sense. So taking the particularities of your life and understanding them within your own historical context is difficult. And then partially it takes some time because I sometimes die of, um, I guess it would be firsthand embarrassment because I'm embarrassed by myself. Uh, it, like this gem that I found in that Beatrix Potter diary. I got frustrated and tore out the first two pages of my other diary. I realized I was too young to understand myself then. And this is like actual footage of eight, eight year old. I was an eight year old, eight year old Brittany swooning dramatically after writing that. It's a good thing I didn't take myself too seriously. Um, all of which, I promise circular. Um, all of which is to say that when I'm making the most out of my life, I feel like are the times when it looks the least like I'm doing work. It's, uh, it's when I am in Washington DC looking at this um, Ron Muck sculpture and thinking about um, the sculpture and the people who are taking selfies with it. And it's when I'm in Alabama, despite the same outfit being worn, this is a different year and a different city. Um, having drinks at a bar with a friend and talking about our work. And it's when I'm, you know, sitting here doing this and watching the birds at my feeder. Uh, and then the last thing I, I promised, it's in the Ulrich update, is that I would give you a little bit um, of a thing that I'm working on. So I'm gonna read you a little bit of an autoethnography chapter from that book. And I chose one that is itself in process. It's a work in progress. It's not done. And this is an excerpt. And I picked this in part because it's my process, but also because the ones that are done are about um, suicide and sexual assault. And that <laughs> didn't really seem like the best place to end our chat today. It was not a very positive, uh, upbeat ending. So this is a, an untitled chapter from the book I'm working on. I am standing in front of the mirror in my bathroom, struggling to meet my own eyes without giggling or flinching. This is an unnatural experience for me. On a good day, I don't look at myself at all. On a bad day, I look like a surgeon with my scalpel honed for slashing. My therapist thinks it will be a good exercise for me to examine myself for 10 seconds, finding only nice things to say to myself about how I look. Unfortunately, like most women that I know, I am desperately underqualified for this. I think about the history of art, which is full of conventionally beautiful for their time, women lazily reclining and admiring themselves in mirrors. There is Narcissus in love with his own reflection. And yes, I know that he's a man, but often an androgynous or even feminine one in depictions like Caravaggio and Lapisa's languid adolescence. There is Velasquez's Rokabi Venus, sinuously sprawled across a bed, admiring her own sumptuous serpentine flesh. Rubens, Venus in front of the mirror, confidently holds our gaze through her reflection, proudly upright as she presents her softly dimpled posterior to us. Uh, and please take a careful look at the upper right of this image for a second. This Venus becomes something of a touchstone for 20th century artist, Robert Rauschenberg, who tantalizes us with her image in a number of works with a notable and I think poignant absence. He removes her black maid, thus allowing us to ogle her without the discomfort of contemplating the Dutch role in the slave trade or the racial politics of the civil rights movements, which were flooding the newspapers he collaged and the airwaves he watched just at the moment that he appropriated this image. In our own time, it allows us to ignore the current oppressive prevalence of white normative beauty standards. At some point in the 20th century, imagery of women in mirrors morphed into a new trope one that was associated with eating disorders. Did these pamphlets and later websites teach women how to dissect their bodies to disassociate and misrecognize them? Or did women's dissatisfaction lead artists to make those images? When did the mirror become such a double-edged sword 
the tool of pathological self-love on the one hand and self-hatred on the other. Perhaps if Narcissus had been subjected to our diet culture, he wouldn't have looked so deeply into that water. It's relatively easy to see through the messages that we hear in the media when they're applied to someone else or when we see them written down. Belly fat making your pants snug and uncomfortable? Perhaps you should buy some new pants. Struggling to remove embarrassing facial hair? Make a toast to Frida Kahlo and stop being embarrassed. Want to stop living with thinning hair? Uh, remember that all of the lustrous manes that you see in the media, they are wigs and weaves and go about your day. It's much harder, however, to apply these ideas to our own bodies, which is why I'm still standing in front of this stupid mirror, struggling to make it to 10. I decided to start by writing a love poem to the parts of myself that I am supposed to hate. One second. Lose one inch of belly fat per week with this one weird trick. I celebrate the fulsome swell of my belly, its soft skin that radiates gentle warmth. Two seconds. Your belly fat is unsightly and makes your pants snug and uncomfortable. To cup, to cradle those curves is a sensual pleasure, a lush luxury that reveals this for a lie. Three seconds. Visibly tighten and lift crow's feet and wrinkles surrounding your eyes in minutes. I crinkle and uncrinkle my eyes. Each line, each wrinkle, a physical reminder of a smile or a sneer. A hundred memories, a thousand moments written into my skin. Those lines, the stanzas of a poem detailing my life, recounting wisdom hard won from tragedies and triumphs. I will not erase this epic from my face. Four seconds. Are you tired of struggling to remove embarrassing facial hair? My eyebrows arch across my face, framing my eyes and asserting the shape of my glasses. Stray hairs grow toward my eyelids and hairline, scattered there like constellations. The occasional wiry whisker on my chin, a link to the hedge witches and wily women of the past, a tiny, sharp blow struck against the patriarchy. Five seconds, get control with a body shaper brief. I claim my generous breasts that pillow my hugs and bolster my snuggles. I praise the round thighs that whisper and shush to the rhythm of my steps. Their gentle friction refuses the silence and docility that society demands from women. Six seconds, a prescription treatment for inadequate or not enough lashes. Short and spiky, even with mascara, my lashes grow in every direction except the one they're supposed to. They won't curl up even under the pressure of a lash curler. They follow their own nature and do as they wish. I hear their message and I too will grow as I dare, as I dream. Seven seconds, stop living with thinning hair. Neither one thing nor the other, not thick or thin, not coarse or fine, not straight or curly. The first gray sneaking in at only 17. Every product wants me to change, but no one says anything about how shiny, how soft to the touch, as downy as a small kitten. No one glorifies the glint of light reflecting from the silver, the white stripes in my hair of fierce tiger's pelt. Men get labeled silver foxes, but I am the fearsome Bengal tiger. Eight seconds. Rev your metabolism with Nutrisystem's Turbo Boost. Is my body a machine? My wide feet and thick ankles are the vehicles of my locomotion, the lever and fulcrum that swing me through space. But my body, my body is magic. I contemplate my hands, the short, broad palms, the stubby fingers. These hands transform thoughts into words on a page, conjure knowledge to be shared with my students, perform more mundane tricks like scratching my dog's ears exactly where they itch. I am not a machine. I am a motherfucking sorceress. Nine seconds. Sculpt your thighs and butt with honey love. I honor my butt, the muscles that move me from here to there, the fat that cushions my hip bones when I sit and raises my height on any chair, a throne that follows me wherever I travel. That butt reminds me I'm a queen when the world says, shrink, shrink until you take up no space at all. 
10 seconds. Make your eyes clearer and whiter with our affordable bright white treatment. My eyes are clear, the scales fallen. I see strength and beauty you want me to ignore. Uh, and that is where I will stop and stop sharing um, and answer any questions you might have. Yeah, everyone give me a second to uh, give you all the go ahead to join the conversation. It's painstakingly slow, but please, um, please join us. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just in the chat where, where Jeff is talking about having a meeting with me. <laughs> yes, I, we have a number of comments in the chat, <clears throat> and most of them, you know, reflecting that that you know it, it's so common to all of us. Um, the journal, the journal entries, and you know, we can all relate. Yeah. I think there's a whole series where people dramatically read their most embarrassing journal entries, which is, you know. Hey, Alicia, where'd you go? <laughs> well, nobody else had their video on, so I was I like, know, me. But you... <laughs> You're not going to be alone. I'm I'm jealous of the, of of your, you know, one day arriving. Uh, <laughs> one day. One day. One day. I am so excited to be so extra and in that star. I, I am. And I Brittany, love it. I have so many unfinished <laughs> knitting projects from the last decades. It's. I, I get it. We should start a knitting group. <laughs> we should. Hi, Jay. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining us. Does anyone have a <laughs> have a question? Sorry, I was just reading the comments. Does anyone have a question for Brittany? Hi, Kristen. Hi, Ksenia. I have a question. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Okay, so you mentioned essentially, you know, the title staring into space, you know, as being an essential part of your creative practice. But then you also mentioned how um, difficult that can be because that's not necessarily viewed upon as you doing anything. How mm -hmm. do you balance that, like um, the need for to stare into space for your creative work, but also I feel like sometimes society pushes a lot of guilt on you when you aren't actively doing you know, I guess, tangible work? Like, how do you balance that and work through that? Um, if you, if you have that experience at all? <laughs> I mean, don't, don't we all? Um, like the sort of the best <clears throat> and worst thing about our jobs, I think, is that there's no defined start and end. Like at any moment, we could be doing things. Uh, so yeah, I feel that guilt. And sometimes um, I feel it while I'm in that moment. I don't, I don't know that I have a good answer for that, Alicia. Um, <laughs> if I had resolved that process, I would have a TED talk, right? <laughs> and probably another book coming out. Yeah. I just, just like anything else that you do for yourself, like deep breathing or meditating or going for a walk or whatever, you just have to carve that time out and ignore that feeling that you should be doing something else. For me, it's usually grading. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Brittany, Lydia Humphreys has a question in the chat box. Um, she asked, what did you say to the person who's, who stared at you in the museum looking at the painting? Oh, it wasn't just one person, Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've, been, you've been to a gallery in New York. Like it's, it's a lot. Um, and that show, it's hard to remember, but I think it was at the MoMA, so there were like a zillion people in there. Um, I didn't say anything. I was busy taking notes to use later. Um, I mean, I think that's part of the process of like coming to terms with what it's like to exist in this world as a person with an identity that isn't cherished, right? 
um, like that stuff hardly bothers me anymore. And this is an example I like to give people is that um, I've been like had stuff shouted at me out of car out of car windows and mood at and stuff so much that I'm just like, yep, you're correct. <laughs> I'm fat. Good call. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> just it doesn't it doesn't bother me anymore. And Emily, Emily also has a question for you. Uh, she says you talked about asking lots of questions in class, but how do you teach the process of staring into space and thinking about everything? And how do you know students are on the right track in developing this academic, academic contemplation practice, if you will? Mm, that's a great question. Um, it's really hard to do. And uh, it's, you start early, you get them in your survey class and then you just keep, <laughs> you keep doing it, uh, I think. I really love our students and I love teaching in a studio and graphic design faculty because they're they're predisposed to look at stuff and analyze it. Um, and they're used to having their own work critiqued in a really sometimes harsh fashion that would maybe make me cry if you guys did it to my work. Uh, so they're they're primed to ask why I think. So it's just encouraging that and getting people out of the idea of like, there's a right answer, you know what I mean? Or that something means, means something. Um, Carl Andre, who, you know, is a potential murderer, but he did say something I found interesting, which is as soon as we start assuming that what we're doing means something, that's when it all goes awry because it's, that's uh, an order that we're imposing on it. You know what I mean? Like it could, it should just be play or process, or it should speak to you emotionally. It doesn't have to mean anything. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, Emily. Yes, Jay. Yeah. Uh, I, this is a fascinating discussion, and I apologize. I'm probably going to have to patch out in a second on this. But uh, one question I was wondering about is gender, because there's a lot of, you know, we talk about the expectation of being productive and having your stuff together and all of that. And it's, you know, men especially get that conversation that if you're, you know, if you're not that kind of hard charging, you know, you know, there's something wrong with you. And I mean, there's a whole shaming side, but of course, as a man, you can't even talk about that because that's, you know, sissy stuff. I mean, have you noticed kind of how men and women deal with these sorts of issues in this kind of self-reflective world and compare contrast? Uh, I mean, to a certain extent, I think you're right. Like men are trained to project confidence. So you hear a lot less of like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. And oh, you know, Jay Price in history is doing it so much better. I wish I my career looked like his. Um, I don't, you know, that's that's how I, I feel like my female friends and I talk to each other, like even in our writing group, oh, your book is so great. I wish that my scholarship looked more like that. Um, I think it's also interesting too, because I mean, if you talk about pushing productivity and efficiency into the domestic sphere, it also doesn't end for women. Like, I feel like my brother doesn't care if his kitchen is dirty, but I'm like, oh my God, I'm a bad woman because my house isn't perfectly clean. And, you know, I didn't wash my sheets this week. So there's a sense in which, we, like, gender also makes busy work in every aspect of a, a woman's life that I don't know that men feel the same pressure. I don't know. Jay, do you feel the same pressure to have your house perfectly clean? There's a sense of, um, you, know, you can put domestic side to, to, but you're supposed to, by contrast, devoting too much time to your house means you're actually not devoting too much time, enough time to your work. And so I think there's that kind of flip side. Oh yeah, this is, um, yeah, that's a fascinating, um, <laughs> fascinating issue. Sorry, I just saw Ksenia saying that she doesn't think she's lost her sheets this year. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know someone that washes them every day and she's giving me a complex. Um, how do I, how do I engage students in autoethnography research? I think, um, 
It starts in the classroom. I mean, I'm always interested in students' responses to the work that we're looking at. Um, and that's a form of autoethnographic knowledge, right? To look at, um, to look at a, a statue of King Tut and say, oh, you know, my grandma has this in her house and then, okay, why? And then we can um, talk about broader issues of like, is, what is Egypt? Is it part of Africa? Is it part of the Middle East? Why do we consider these people white? Why are they part of Western culture? Um, so uh, to, yeah, to a certain extent, I think we're, we're doing that in class. Um, in terms of their papers, I don't, I haven't really implemented this as a method of knowledge making um, because I'm at the moment, like my main goal is to set people up to figure out how to research things that interest them later in life when they get out of here and they've forgotten everything I ever said to them. Um, so they can be like, you know what? I, I would like to know more about um, uh, Tom Otterness. So here's how you go to the library or here's how you find a good website with a bibliography. Um, but that's a good idea. Maybe I should start incorporating that into my 500 level questions, or sorry, 500 level classes. Uh, as for uh, makes more room for uh, students to go into the field of art history, I hope so. I mean, like most academic disciplines, we are appallingly white um, and bougie. Uh, and it's really caused a lot of blind spots, I think, in the artists who get attention and the um, the scholarship that's produced and it's changing to a certain degree. Um, speaking of which, uh, we have a fantastic up and coming scholar uh, of color who will be talking at the Art History Awards in May. Um, and you should come and hear her perspective on that question because she's just the greatest. Uh, it is uh, a student that I know from Missouri Western, her name is Alexis, and she is now, she's got a fellowship to Wash U um, and has done an internship at the Smithsonian, and she's going to hopefully talk to our students about going to grad school and getting that internship and um, how, how to succeed. Yes, and the Art History Awards this year are on Friday, May 14th. Uh, six o'clock. Six, yes, six o'clock. So you can go to our programs page on, on the All Riches website and register. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Autoethnographers that you should check out. Oh my gosh, so many. <laughs> There's so many. I'm struggling. I don't know. I don't know Agnes Kayard, Kullard. Who is she, Emily? She's a um, professor of the philosophy of ethics at the University of Chicago. And she writes for the New York Times and the Point Magazine. Oh, okay. Well, now I know what I'm doing with this afternoon. I'll uh, send you some links. <laughs> uh, I sort of ran into autoethnography through fat studies. Um, there's a woman named Leslie Owen, who is a sociologist that um, has done some work on like phenomenology and fat studies. Um, that I think is really valuable. And then just from there, I, you know, researched it on my own. There's actually a really good um, essay about writing autoethnography and finding a home for it, finding a publication for it. Um, oh my gosh, the lady's name. It came out of some sociological work that she was doing about international adoptions. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Emily, her name is done in my head. Um, I will send you, how about this? I'll send you a PDF if you send me an email. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's in my miscellaneous folder. Do we have any other questions for Brittany? Were you talking about Prima Maholtra? For the autoethnography of inner country adoptions. Sorry. Maybe. That sounds plausible. Uh, Ticinia, probably. I, I would believe that. I keep seeing ads for it, I think, on my Facebook feed or something. 
I so it, I think it's because of that that I just recently learned that autoethnography was a thing. Yeah, um, as you saw from my screenshot, because of my research, they mainly recommend diets and snack foods to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I get the 10 weird tricks to do things too in various contexts, but um, um, yeah, that's a good, I should write that down. Uh, how many art history students at WSU now, Lee Starkle asked. Um, well, we have a ton because the new BAA degree students take art history classes, but if you're asking about majors, I think we're about eight total. Gabby, does that sound about right to you? Uh, yes, it sounds about right, but there are a good amount more coming up through um, transitioning into their second, well, their second year. What tends to happen is students, you know, really don't start out art history, um, <laughs> but like through taking art history classes is when they normally become art history majors, usually in their second and third year. So it's hard to nail those numbers down. Yeah, I, that's what happened to me. Lydia, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, so I was wondering, I know this is like mildly off topic, but <clears throat> in terms of like, I know you use um, like ads and stuff frequently within like your presentation and um, somebody that I've been like following lately in their activism is like Jamil Jamel. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, I'm like curious how you feel about like her using her place of activism in, in her place of like power of you know, being a celebrity, which kind of derives from exploitation of other people. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you feel about that, like, relationship between her activism and where she is in life? Um, she's fascinating to me because I think on the one hand, it's, like, really powerful for her to expose that these people that we see as kind of airbrushed final products, like, have these same issues and struggles and go through these things and like talking um, about products that they shouldn't use that are gonna give you diarrhea or whatever is um, fascinating. I'm a little, I'm always interested when she takes on other famous people, like she, she goes after the Kardashians a lot, which is very interesting to me because uh, like more than any other public people, like you can see them literally embodying these social pressures on women. Like over time, they're just like taking on this burden and trying to achieve ideal perfection, which is never gonna happen. Um, so I see them in some respect. I mean, I know that they have agency and they could choose to be like, whatever, I'm gonna have a pot belly today. Um, <laughs> the, the things that they're putting out are a direct result kind of of the pressure that is on them as a public figure. I don't know, it's very, um, it's very interesting to me um, and her sort of method of like, she's like a Barb, right? Like a Nicki Minaj stand, like she will just go after people. And I don't know that that's always the most protective thing to do to other women. So does that answer your question? Well, Brittany, I don't, I don't have a question, but I really enjoyed your talk and thanks for calling me out a couple of times there. I appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> but, uh, I'll try, I'll try to, to leave you alone when I see you in your office staring off into space more in the future, but oftentimes <laughs> I just want to say hi and uh, then things come up because my mind, I think a lot like yours just doesn't shut off of, of things that are going on. So, uh, but I really enjoyed the talk. Good, thanks, thanks. You uh, feel free to interrupt me. I'm used to it at this point. <laughs> you and you and uh, Robert. I don't know if he's here. This is a direct call out, Robert Bob. Um. <laughs> well, I, I often think if you don't want to be interrupted, shut your door. So you know, that's just what I think. You know. It's hot in there. If I shut my door, Jeff. <laughs> Also, I want credit for being at work. I want everyone to notice that I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Brittany. It was it was a fascinating talk, and I'm looking forward to to uh, seeing more of the new book.
Thanks, guys. Thanks Without for question. Me. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. And we will see you next week. Yes. Uh, for Jennifer Ray and Megan St. Clair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can ask her about, she said she's been stopped by the cops between 100 and 200 times. So I feel like you should ask her about that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, have had to, uh, I have had to write letters for Jennifer when she goes to Cuba to verify that she actually is a university employee and is actually doing research. So <laughs> please don't arrest her. <laughs> uh, Bye, everybody. Uh, have a lovely afternoon. See you next week. Thank you, Brittany.